The story is told of the Goldsteins. They came from the old country. They moved to America with really not a penny to their name. Luck has it, Mr. Goldstein walks into 7-Eleven. He buys a lottery ticket. And God shines down on him that fine morning, and he wins many, many millions of dollars. He sees it as a divine sign that he's meant for bigger and better things, and he moves to a penthouse on Central Park East, and he removes himself from the Jewish heritage that he had known so well for so many years in the old country. He hangs out with the elite, the wealthy, the aristocratic, and doesn't really associate much more with his Jewish brethren. Time goes by and he's somewhat lonely. And his wife says, you know what, let's have, for old time's sake, for old time's sake, let's have a party. We'll invite the Goldmans and the Feldmans for dinner. And we'll schmooze a little bit about what it was back in the day when we used to live in the old country. And sure enough, they set a date. That morning, Mr. Goldstein says, you know, he says to the butler, we're having some old friends over. You probably don't recognize them. You don't, they're not familiar in these circles. But um, if you don't mind for supper, please set a beautiful table for six. And we'll be having the dinner, you know, the three couples. And they go out for a day on the town. 6 p.m., they come back to the house to freshen up a little bit before the guests come over. And they see that the dining room is set for 10. And Mrs. Goldstein's quite disappointed. The butler is supposed to do his job. And she walks over and says, um, I asked you to set for six, so why did you set for ten? And the butler says, yes, uh, Mrs. Feldman called. She says she's bringing the blintzes and knishes. <laughs> Thank you. The, the celebration tonight, as we've all brought friends, and there are blintzes and knishes, we celebrate... As Ben mentioned so nicely, we celebrate, we mark the past, we celebrate the present, and we look, to, we look towards the future. It is with a heavy heart that I mark the past. This past, this past year, Chabad of Mitzafik lost two members. Janice Sandler and Michael Levine both, both passed away this year, two strong, integral parts of our community. Remembering Michael back, uh, I'm going to say nine years ago on the Cedar Road ball fields, watching Parker play soccer, no, playing catcher, playing catcher for the uh, Little League, and having met Janice only two years ago, but became very quickly a very proud mother and grandmother. Three generations here at Chabad, they are sorely missed, and their families that are here today, may they continue to shine down on you and be a source of blessing for all those here, family and friends gathered together. Together with that, we mark the present. We celebrate the honorees that are here tonight. And the story comes to mind, a friend of mine, Rabbi Avraham Berkowitz. Rabbi Berkowitz was a yeshiva boy, and as is customary in Chabad circles, during the summer months, during the Passover break, during the Sukkot break, many people go home to celebrate with their families. In the Chabad community, the Rebbe instituted that we do the opposite. We go out, we leave our homes, we go to small towns throughout the world, to find a community that doesn't have a rabbi, that doesn't have an established Jewish community, and make a seder for them, make a Rosh, Hashan a Rosh Hashanah service for them. So Rabbi Berkowitz was called by Rabbi Greenberg, the Chabad rabbi in Anchorage, Alaska, and he said, Avremi, Rabbi Berkowitz, maybe you come spend uh, a couple weeks here in Anchorage, get to know the locals, maybe some salmon fishing, maybe some tefillin with some Jews. You'll find probably more trout than Jews, but... Uh, up in the frozen chosen up north, we can definitely use some more hands. So Rabbi Berkowitz with a friend went up to Alaska and they would spend some mornings learning with Rabbi Greenberg's children. And in the afternoons or for extended weekends, they would travel to the small little towns throughout Alaska. One weekend, they actually flew to the northwest of Alaska, small little islands where they actually could see Russia. And um, he get a, gets a call from a local school, a public school on small little island, a school probably a total of 200 children. They said, we heard there's rabbis from Brooklyn in town. News travels fast. Do you mind coming to our school and talking to the students? They've never seen a real live Jew before. <laughs> so Rabbi Berkowitz and his friends say, Not a, look, we'd be honored to. They come to the school and 
it's a Q and A and a townhouse meeting, and everyone asks their questions, and everyone speaks, and all the interesting questions that really local children in Northwest Alaska have from a rabbi from Brooklyn. And Rabbi Berkowitz knows that this is a unique opportunity. There probably will never be another rabbi, maybe even another Jew in this town. And he's wondering, what, can, what message can I leave them with? And he asks, Does, has anyone here ever seen a Jew before? And a little girl in the back of the room says, yeah, my mom. Okay, halakhically that means you're a Jew. Where's your mom? And after school, with permission from the principal, the, they call the mom, and Rabbi Berkowitz goes over to their home. And he's again thinking to himself, I have ten minutes to leave an impression on this, on this family. What do you say to a family, a Jewish family, thousands of miles from any real established Jewish community? I have one brief moment, what do I say? And it's those moments that many of us have, they just close your eyes and say, God, put the right words in my mouth. And Rabbi Berkowitz says, you know, there's a tradition that every Friday night, Jewish women light the Shabbat candles. And it represents the fact that a woman is the spiritual foundation of the home, it represents the fact that we bring extra light and warmth into our world, into our community, into our house. And Friday night, the first Friday night candles are lit in southern Australia. And a few minutes go by and goes to Sydney and Melbourne and Perth and then Southeast Asia and then Europe and Israel and Africa and then it goes across the Atlantic and Jewish women progressively throughout the entire world are lighting Shabbat candles and this glow, this fire, this serenity and peacefulness expands throughout the entire world. New York, St. Louis, California, Anchorage, the last place on earth that lights the Friday night candles is here in northwest Alaska. God waits every moment, an entire Friday evening, where in some places it's already Saturday morning. God is waiting for you to light your candle. The entire of humanity has not truly ushered in Shabbat until you light your candle. With that, he leaves her with a message, and he leaves the home, never to see her again. But I think as we celebrate honorees, and as, and as each, un, each one of us gather together in celebrating our friends, our community, in essence really celebrating today and what each, the potential each one of us have, it's not just a girl in Alaska that has that potential. Each one of us have that ability to make a difference, to bring that small candle, that small light, that little, the little bit of positive energy, bring that into our life and make a difference to our little world that we are able to influence. And when we're able to tap in, into that, we know that the future is bright. In the mid-1980s, there was a wealthy philanthropist who decided on sponsoring a campaign through Chabad headquarters of on the front page of the New York Times every single Friday. There was a small little ad in the bottom right corner that said, Jewish women and girls, please light Shabbat candles tonight. And it said the candle lighting time in the New York metropolitan area. And it went on for a little time. New York Times does not allow much advertising on, them from, on their front page. I actually believe they have no ads on their front page back in, the ni back in the 80s. But this was, somebody knew somebody, and they allowed that little ad to be placed for about five years. Every Friday night, an ad on the bottom of the New York Times front page. This gentleman lost some money. He was not able to continue the campaign. And the day came that the, the ad was removed and the New York Times no longer published it. Y2K, we all remember. It was uh, year 2000. The New York Times published their January 1st front page, their, their newspaper for January 1st, 2000. And with a touch of humor, a couple pages later, they published the New York Times front page January 1st, 2100. Look it up. It was a comic piece, and they were projecting what the world would look like in 100 years. Aliens were communicating from Mars, and many other abstract ideas that maybe or maybe might not happen. And on the bottom right of the homepage, the front page of the New York Times, it said, Jewish women and girls, please light candles tonight 
whatever time it will be, January 1st, 2100. Please light candles tonight. Cute. One of the members at Chabad headquarters called up New York Times and said, it's a nice idea, it's cute, but why do you do it? Who, who pulled rank? Who decided to put that little corner piece in? And he got the contact, the person who's responsible for what goes on the cover page of the New York Times, and he calls him up, a non-Jewish gentleman, and he said, I'm not Jewish, I'm a proud Roman Catholic, but when I published the New York Times of what's going to be in 100 years, aliens might, might not be on the front page. The wars in Europe might, might not be. The economy might be good, might be bad. But one thing I was positive will be was that in 100 years, there will be Jewish women Friday night lighting Shabbat candles at the exact time. It is the people that we celebrate tonight. Telesniks, the Coopers, and slightly biased, my favorite honoree, Bracha. <laughs> the, the honorees we celebrate here tonight. It is these people, and it is everybody that steps up to the plate to make a difference. That ensures that in 100 years, in 200 years, forever and ever, there will be a strong sense of Jewish community. There will be people who Friday night will be lighting candles. And there will be people in Alaska, in Comac, wherever we may be, that they, they will be making a difference. So the people we celebrate tonight, it's not just ideas. We all have lofty ideas. We pause briefly in a busy year, in a hectic life, in a chaotic world that we live in. We set aside, we set aside time to say a genuine and truthful thank you for what you do your time, your energy, your sacrifices that you do give up for the broader community, and it is you that make a difference. And don't think that it doesn't make a difference. One little candle, one little girl in Alaska, one little ad in the New York Times, that is what ensures and grounds the future of the Jewish people. We would like to call up each honoree to say a lengthy speech, <laughs> but instead we actually had them record some thoughts beforehand back in the room before everyone came. Ladies and gentlemen, please pay attention to the screens. Mazel tov to the Coopers.